Remember when I told you in past episodes that chronicling Egypt's early history, let alone its early known dynasties, can be extremely difficult? Well, perhaps nowhere else in Egyptology is this more true than with Egypt's second dynasty. Of course, that's not going to stop us from covering it in this installment of Ancient Egypt, Dynasty by Dynasty. We still don't know why the death of Ka'a brought about the end of Egypt's first dynasty. Perhaps he had no heir, and so the kingship went to one of his relatives, or even a different but respected and powerful noble family. Some have also suggested that perhaps there were a number of usurpers who fought for the throne, which may have caused Egypt's ruling house to break apart. There's no evidence to indicate that the transition from the first to the second dynasty was violent. In fact, the second dynasty's first king, Hotep Sekhemwi, actually oversaw the burial of Ka'a, as has been determined from one of Hotep Sekhemwi's seals that was discovered at the entrance of Ka'a's royal tomb in Abydos. What's interesting is that for his own burial, Hotep Sekhemwi seems to have broken with the tradition of being buried in Abydos, and instead had his body placed at the Great Cemetery at Saqqara, near the country's capital of Memphis. Hotep Sekhemwi's name has been found on many objects and artifacts throughout Egypt. Despite this, extremely little is known about his reign, including its length. For example, the king list known as the Turin Canon states that he ruled for 95 years, which Egyptologists flatly reject. Manito, who calls him Boethos, writes that he ruled for 38 years, during which there may have been a disastrous earthquake, which caused a lot of death and destruction. Other than this, little else is known about the Second Dynasty's first ruler. Like with Hotep Sekhemui, very little is known about his successor, Raneb. In fact, it's not even agreed upon within the scholarly community if that's even his actual name. Raneb means, Ra is my lord, as in the Egyptian god Ra. However, if you switch the Neb and Ra around, you get Nebra, meaning Lord of the Sun. Old hieroglyphs can be very confusing and are not always very straightforward. The name Raneb or Nebra has been found on seals in at least two tombs at Saqqara, one being that of his father, Hotep Sakhemwi, indicating that he probably presided over his funeral, and another at a site nearby, believed to have been his own tomb. As of now, there hasn't been a tomb belonging to Nebra that has been discovered in Abydos. So perhaps, like his father, he also preferred Saqqara as his final resting place. Finally, with the second dynasty's third king, Ninetcher, we start to get some information of real significance. This is in a large part due to the Palermo stone recording specific events from his reign, which it suggests lasted for 35 years. Most of the events listed were various festivals that the king was required to preside over. It's also stated that the countrywide census was carried out several times. Registers from Ninetcher's reign on the Palermo stone read something like this. Register 3 Dual appearance of the king of Upper and Lower Egypt Running of the Apis Bull Register 4 Processional tour of Horus Fifth time of the census Register 5 Appearance of the king of Lower Egypt Second time of the festival of Seker Register 6 Processional tour of Horus Sixth time of the census And it goes on as important as they may be, 
I'm sure that many people would find reading such entries from the Palermo Stone to be a bit repetitious and, well, boring. But let's take a look at the next register. Register 7. First time of the festival, Horus of Heaven. Hacking up, Shemra and Mehu. That's one translation. Instead of hacking, one could also read it as attacking Shemra and Mehu. I haven't been able to find the location of the first place, but I've seen the second name, Mehu, translated as meaning House of the North, or simply North Land, which is a reference to the Nile Delta region of Lower Egypt. It's a bit strange though that during Ninetcher's 35 year reign, with the exception of one ceremony performed at the city of Nekeb in Upper Egypt, the Palermo Stone says little of his activities outside of Memphis. Many scholars argue that these, along with mention of the attacks on Shemra and Mehu, are evidence of a civil war in Egypt at the time. Like his two predecessors, archaeologists have not discovered a tomb belonging to Ninetcher in the royal cemetery of Abydos. While scholars generally agree on the first three kings of Dynasty II, there's great debate as to who ruled after Ninetcher, as well as how much territory they ruled over, and for how long. There seems to have been several contenders for the throne. One was a ruler whose name is read as Weneg. Weneg's name, though, has only been found in Saqqara, and if he did indeed rule, he may have had little authority outside the capital. In addition, a tomb for him has not been found. Another possible successor may have been a ruler named Senejd. Very little material evidence of him remains, but his name has been found on several king lists. And then there is Nebnefer, who some believe may have briefly ruled just after the death of Nenecher. His name, though, shows up only twice on stone vessels that were found around the Great Steppe Pyramid of Saqqara. It's all pretty confusing, and with such scant evidence, there are no shortage of theories as to what may have transpired after Ninetcher's death. Clearly though, something revolutionary was going on, because the next king, at least compared to his predecessors, was a bit of a radical. His name was Seth Peribsen, or simply Peribsen. Peribsen is one of those unique figures in ancient Egyptian history who perhaps like Pharaoh Akhenaten over 13 centuries later, may have briefly broken with Egyptian tradition and mainstream religion. Some scholars believe that he may have once gone by the name Horus Sekemib, though there's also evidence indicating that this may have been a completely different person. Regardless, up until Peribsen, kings from at least the pre-dynastic period had what was known as a Sarek with a Horus falcon upon it. You can think of a Sarek as a personal or distinctive coat of arms that each Egyptian king had. The falcon on top represented the god Horus. Peribsen though dropped the Horus falcon from his Sarek to include only the Seth animal, which is the symbol of the god Set or Seth. In case you're wondering what exactly the Seth animal is or was, you're not alone. Egyptologists have proposed everything from it being some type of jackal with the features of a pig, to an aardvark, a special breed of dog, or a mix of several of these animals. Just why Peribsen chose to drop the Horus from his Sarek in favor of Seth is a mystery. What is known is that by the end of his reign, Peribsen seems to have reunited the lands of Upper and Lower Egypt though the details of how he did this are still unknown. Peribsen may have been a member of a branch of the royal family from Upper Egypt, or perhaps a usurper who was able to mobilize the followers of the god Seth under his banner to become the one true king of Egypt. Despite discarding the traditional Horus falcon from his Sarek, 
Peribsen's decision to make the royal cemetery of Abydos his final resting place, like several kings of pre-dynastic Egypt, as well as all of the rulers of the first dynasty, shows that he at least wished to be somewhat associated with the kings of the past. At around 16 by 13 meters, his tomb is relatively small, with the burial chamber being made of mud brick, unlike those of the first dynasty, which were once lined with wood. Kasek Hemwi is regarded by Egyptologists to have been the last king of the second dynasty. Compared to his predecessors, much more is known about his reign. Kasek Hemwi seems to have been a unifying figure between the followers of Horus and those of Seth. At the beginning of his reign, he adopted the Horus name Kasekhem, meaning the power has appeared, and seems to have shown special reverence for Hierakonpolis, which in Greek means city of the falcon, due to its association with the god Horus. Later on though, he added the Seth animal to his Serek, and changed his name to Kasekhemwi, meaning the two powers have appeared. Another way of saying it is, the two lords are at peace in him. Kasekhemwi wanted to be the king of all of Egypt, and this included the followers of Horus and Seth. Scholars have come up with the following general narrative as to what may have happened during the reign of Kasekhemwi. It goes something like this. Upon Peribsen's death, Lower Egypt once again rebelled, and for all practical purposes, seceded from the unified kingdom. When Peribsen's successor, who at the time went by the name Kasekhem, was crowned king, he lacked authority beyond Upper Egypt. Through sheer force, he led military campaigns to subdue his rebellious northern subjects, and eventually reunited the two lands of Upper and Lower Egypt. Perhaps to foster greater unity, he adopted the new name, Kasakhemwi, meaning the two lords are at peace in him, as well as added the symbol of the god Seth to his Serek. Lower Egypt may not have been the only place that Kasakhemwi campaigned, since a seal impression found with his name on it gives him the title, Overseer of Foreign Lands. In addition, a fragment of a stela mentions battling a foreigner followed by a bow, which was also the hieroglyph that was used to identify the land of Nubia, just south of Egypt. The Egyptians called this place Ta Seti, meaning land of the bow, which was in reference to Nubia's famous archers. Kasakemwi's massive burial complex within the royal cemetery of Abydos was the largest of any royal resting place up until that time. Its walls can still be seen even today, over 45 centuries later. In fact, there are several complexes. One is a large trapezoidal structure that's divided into at least 58 rooms, with the king's burial chamber at the center. Another large structure, almost like a fortress, is known today by its Arabic name, Shunit el Zabib. It likely housed many of the grave goods that the ancient Egyptians believed would be transported into the afterlife with their king. Based on evidence from the Palermo Stone and other sources, Kasakemwi is believed to have ruled for 18 years and died around 2690 BC. Kasakemwi's reign marks a new chapter in ancient Egypt's history. He seems to have finally brought internal peace and stability to the country, and this would be very important for the next few dynasties, without which the great cultural and architectural achievements, specifically of the kings from the period that historians call the Old Kingdom, may never have taken place. We'll take a look at these in some of the next few programs on Dynasties 3 and 4. Stay tuned. Let's be honest. Not a lot of people are interested in Egypt's second dynasty, so the fact that you made it this far shows just how dedicated you are to learning about this stuff. And that's really awesome. 
I'd also really like to thank GrandKick69, Yap de Graf, Pasta Frola, Michael Lewis, Daniel Allen, Danny Van Eck, WenXTV, Robert Morgan, Frank, Tim Lane, Candice Whipple, Brendan Redman, Faridun Dadachanji, Cher Cam, Farhad Kama, and all of the channel's patrons on Patreon for helping to support this and all future content. Check out the benefits to being a Patreon member, and if you'd like to join, feel free to click the link in the video description. You can also follow History with Sai on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, as well as continue to listen to special audio programs on the History with Sai podcast. Thanks again, and stay safe.